Good morning, folks. Good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, had a good turnout yesterday for Preacher Lawson's birthday party. If you missed it, you missed a good time of fellowship. And he turned 50 yesterday. No, wait a minute. That's, I think that, I, I think I'm catching on now because we've had that 50th birthday for 26 straight years. I, but anyway, it was a good time. I had a good time. And thank the Lord that uh, we have had our pastor as long as we have. And I, I pray. Yep. I pray the Lord grants us many, many more years. I, I, I would ask that that the Lord grants our pastor's presence with us until the rapture of the church. And uh, we're going to have a wedding shower for Emily Brown and Josh Yates on September the 25th at 4.30 at the Fellowship Hall up here. This uh, young man right over here in the back is Josh. And Emily, where is she? Where is she? I don't see her. But anyway, it's hiding. Um, so you register at Walmart and Bed and Bath and Beyond. Josh and Emily will be married in Townsend on November the 5th, 22. So remember that. Um, after that, uh, after the evening service on September the 25th, they'll have an afterglow here at the church. So remember that, all you young folks, be sure and come. Uh, Brother Greg, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. I think we could all walk a little closer to the Lord. I know I can. If you would stand, get your All-American Church hymnal, turn to page number 227, just a closer walk with thee.
Thank you. Thank you. God bless all of you. Amen. God has blessed us at Calvary. Good to have you this morning. By the visiting first time, would you raise your hand and we'll give you a card and let you fill it out. All right, a bunch of folks back in this side over here. And anybody in the center? Anybody on this side? All right. You folks back here in the back, where y'all from? Okay. Ohio, good to have you. Amen. Youngstown, good to have you. Amen. Somebody else on this side over here? You're with them. Okay. <laughs> Settles that quickly. Amen. All right. Well, good to have you. Make yourself at home with us today. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you did for me yesterday. A lot of hard work went into it. I got all kinds of cards. Cards had cards in them and money in them. I don't deserve all that stuff. God's been good to me. And I want you to know I'm thankful. Amen. I am. I thank God every day. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. 76 years old. God's been good to me. I, you know, the people around, I'm sure, that are in better shape than I am, but I'm here, I'm standing, I'm breathing. You know, thank the good Lord. I've got a lot to be thankful for. One more time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, brother. Thank you, Preacher Lawson. I'd like to invite the choir up. We'll be singing out of the church hymnal this morning, page number 199, where the soul never dies. All that will come soon.
if you would stand again, get your church hymnal, turn to page number 390. There's power in the blood. 390. as the choir comes down. to hear about the blood without with the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin let's have the ushers come up here this morning take up the offering let's pray folks Thank you, Lord, for letting us come to your house, for letting me awake this morning. And Heavenly Father, for breathing right now. Lord, my heart beats, my mind thinks, I'm saved. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless the congregation gathered together. We don't know who's saved, we don't know who's lost. You do, though. 
And we pray you'd do what you want to do in this house today. We pray you'd bless this offering and time we have together. May the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted in his holy name. Amen. Amen. about a song from God, folks. Amen. <laughs> yes, there is. Let's see. Bernie McLeod and Rose Sherlin will sing for us this morning. scriptures all fulfilled and we're waiting now for Jesus to appear soon the saints of all the ages join the song of victory praising Jesus will be our endless theme when it's time he will come 
come and we all know the battle's been won we will lay our armor down and pick up a robe and crown and we'll go home to be with Jesus when it's time of my Savior, but serving Him has been such a thrill. I have never seen the gates of that city, oh, but one day, one day I will. One day streets of your gold and they tell me the path has never yet been told I'll be united with loved ones on Zion's holy hill one day one day I will from the time I first met him, he's been all to me, and my life with his joy he has filled, and I'm longing for the day when my eyes shall behold him, thank God one day, one day. One day I'm going to walk on streets of pure gold, and they tell me the hat has never yet been told. I'll be united with loved ones on Zion, holy hill. One day, one day. some little ones that want to quote the scripture for us today. Yeah. Amen. Some of the words these little ones quote, they don't know it yet, but some of these words are 4,000 years old. and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalms 86, 15. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he make it to, to me to lie down in green pasture. Disciple is not above his master, but everyone who is perfect shall be as his master. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Psalm 118, 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now that's a treat. Amen. All right. Good, good, good. Okay, if you have your Bibles, hope you have. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16 with me this morning, please. 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And let's come down to verse number 11. 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and verse number 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. He was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance, goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now watch verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Amen. He went home. Ramah was his home. Yeah. What you have here is the anointing of a king. Right. This had nothing to do, of course, with the house of Saul. Saul had no part in it. But God had rejected Saul and his kingdom and now had turned to a man after his own heart, David. David has a tomb. As a matter of fact, in Jerusalem, you can go to his tomb. And uh, I've been there a number of times now. It's quite a thing. It's set aside in Israel, all of Israel. They love David. They respect him with every way they possibly can. David is one of the most well-known names in all the world. This king of Israel the second one, to be the king of Israel. No two men could be more different than David and Saul. Saul was chosen. You remember I mentioned to you the other day, I don't know if it's Wednesday or Sunday, whenever, that when Saul's name was called to be brought before the thousands of Israel, he had hidden himself. And so therefore they had to find him. Now we have David being anointed as the king of Israel. When Saul was anointed, the oil came forth from a vial, which is a man-made thing. But when David was anointed as the king, the oil came forth from a horn, which is a God-made thing, an animal that lived. Therefore, the horn of the animal represents its strength because the altar had horns. And when you came up and took hold of the horns of the altar, as Joab did, you're pleading on the strength of God and confessing that you are weak and can no longer go on your own. So the power that came upon David that day was a power that had been on none before. For this is the first real king that Israel would ever have, anointed of God. Amen. The man that did the anointing was Samuel. He was the last and greatest of all the prophets, of all the spiritual men that ever walked this earth. Samuel stood head and shoulders with the rest above all. God said of Samuel, and he said this of Abraham, though they stood before me and pleaded for the people, Samuel was an intercessor. He loved his people and he loved God. His authority was unquestioned. No one would question the authority of Samuel to anoint the king of Israel. None, none, because they respected him, loved him, and revered him and set him aside. He was called a peer in his day, a prophet. And so Samuel takes a horn of oil and he anoints David as the king. This is something that God does and man can do nothing about it whatsoever. But in 1 Samuel chapter number 18 and verse number 9, we have an issue coming up, and you're well aware of things like this. 1 Samuel chapter number 18 and verse number 9. The women come back, and they, I mean, the, the, the soldiers come back, and the women begin to sing praises and say, Saul has killed his thousands 
and David his tens of thousands. And immediately, verse number 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 18, Saul eyed David from that day forward. Jealousy rose up in his soul. That jealousy would eventually destroy him. Now, those of you in this house this morning, be listening wherever you are, I want to say something to you. When you receive a spirit, my friend, you'll never receive just that spirit. When you receive a spirit, that spirit opens a door to another spirit. You'll always go down a path. If jealousy was the door that you allowed to open and a spirit came into you, that spirit will bring other spirits with you. And your downfall is certain. For these spirits are works. They are powerful. They are intelligent beings. They don't play games with you. And my friend, it's not a fleshly issue. A lot of people think, well, if I can just deal with my flesh. Folks, this arm is not my problem. My problem is the old man. And the only one that is capable of defeating the old man is the God man that went to the cross at Calvary. If you would take seriously this spiritual battle that you're in, Saul fell for it and his jealousy ate him up. He, he literally became insane. He came to the point where he would kill priests at a moment just to retain his kingdom. And so my friend David rose to power in the midst of of that kind of situation. David wrote some of the Psalms. He wrote many of the Psalms. As a matter of fact, the Psalms, a book of songs, songs, wonderful, beautiful songs. Some of these songs are called the songs of degrees. As you rise to the top of the temple mount and each step you take, you think about what you're doing, what you're saying as you are approaching onto the height of Moriah. That's the way your Christian life ought to be. Take very seriously your steps as you approach unto God. But some of the Psalms were songs that David wrote while he was a fugitive, while he was running from Saul who was out to kill him. For example, the 27th Psalm and verse number one says this, Psalm 27 and verse number one, David writes and here's what he says. The Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? David was a deeply spiritual man, folks. To write words like this, you say, well, he was also a murderer. I understand all of that. David ran the gamut of everything that happens to a human being. He was all man. When he sinned, he sinned. And the sin that he brought into his life cost, my dear friend, the life of his children and brought sorrow into his life. But I want you to understand something. Of all the people that lived in that Bible, he is one that absolutely knew what it was to get right with God. To thee and thee only have I sinned and done this wickedness in your sight. And he confessed it, got on his face, poured his heart out to, for God to forgive him for it. See, that's the problem with religion. Religion makes you feel good. Religion gives you things. And religion says all these fluffy things around here. But religion doesn't know how to get your heart right with God. And the only way that it'll ever get right with God is to repent. Let the Spirit of God begin to work on your soul. Yeah. Psalm chapter number 54 and verse 1. He said this, Save me, O God, by thy name. Judge me by thy strength. You're the judge, and he is. You remember what Sarah said to Abraham? Let God be the judge between the two of us. And she did. She put him on the spot. She said, let the Lord be the judge. You know something? That was the day that the greatest burden was lifted off of my soul. Say, when was that, preacher? When God didn't let me be the judge anymore. Amen. He took what was right, his right, what belonged to him rightfully. I've got enough to worry about right here. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm looking at my number one enemy. Amen. If you get that message, it'll help you a great deal. Psalm 142, David said this. Verse 1, I cried to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord did I make my supplication. How long has it been since you cried to him? How long has it been since you prayed? Have you prayed today? Did you pray yesterday? Did you pray this past week? You can preach too much. You can talk too much. You can sing too much. You can work too much. You can do all of this, but you'll never pray too much. I keep saying that because I wanted to get hold of your heart. Because when you realize you're not praying, you need to understand there's something wrong in my life. There's something wrong if I'm not talking to God. Have you been talking to the Lord? He wants to hear from you. And so the Bible said he cried unto the Lord and he heard his voice. 
Don't you to notice what he says in verse number five of Psalm 142. This is something. I cried unto the Lord and said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Did you see that? Then I look at verse 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Boy, that's something. No man cared for my soul. Have you been part of the religious movement today, part of the contemporary scene? And you begin to understand that it's all about a performance and how I feel? Have you begun to understand that not a soul in that house, for the most part, cares whether you live or die? If you belong to a church that is a church of the living God that has fellowship with the Lord, we love each other and we'll bear each other's burdens. And we'll go into the closet and we'll pray one for another. And you'll see the power of God begin to move in that house. So David was quite a man. He had charisma. What does that mean? It meant that people were drawn to him. You know, Abigail, she was drawn to David. He, of course, being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, draws people to him. The Lord Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. There's something about him that drew me to him. And I'm still there, amen. There's nowhere else to go. I'm going to stay right there, drawn by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Why, preacher? He's beautiful. He's holy. He can forgive my sin. And he blesses my life. He gives me everything that I need. He's the source of my life to look to the cross. So David said, David was quite a man once again. In 1 Samuel chapter number 22, I want you to notice what it says about David. In 1 Samuel chapter number 22 and verse number 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And the Bible said, And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And on it goes. And this represents the people who are needy. They're needy. You need money, you need food, you need clothing, you need the necessities of life. The Bible says the Lord knoweth that you have need of these things. We understand all of that, absolutely. But the one that you have most need of is God himself. He's the fountain of living water. Amen. He's the river that will never run dry. Though you be planted by a river of waters, you'll take your root. And I don't care if the dry comes and make a difference if the famine shows up. You will live and you will eat and God will bless you. But it comes from him. It comes from him. Not what he does for you, but who he is to you. And that's everything. So these people came to him because he was able to hear them, feel them, touch them. They knew that he cared about their problems. They were needy people. But you notice what it says over here in 1 Chronicles chapter number 11. And here we have more coming to him. 1 Chronicles chapter number 11. I know I'm running you all over the Bible, but it's good. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's see. I was in Psalms. I was in Chronicles. I was in 1 Samuel. That's right. 1 Chronicles chapter number 11 and verse 1. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David and to Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Then came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron. And for the first seven years of his, of his monarchy, he ruled in Hebron. The first seven years, Israel gathered together from all of the tribes of Israel. They came to David at Hebron. Now, what's important about Hebron? What is a bit, what's so important about this place? Hebron. It's an ancient city. And if you go to Israel today, you'll find a place called the Cave of Machpelah. The Cave of Machpelah is the cave of the patriarchs. There's a building that's been standing there for centuries. I went there one time, went, went into it. And went to, the, went to the place where Abraham is buried. Isaac is buried. Jacob is buried. Imagine one tomb on this earth that has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. And Sarah is buried there. And Rebecca is buried there. And Leah is buried there. So no wonder they call it the tomb of the patriarch. 
the word Hebron means joined together. Hebron is the place where Israel goes to to get its foundation. It's like their constitution. They go there, these are our fathers. This is where we came from. This is our identity. And so, my dear friend, when he came to Hebron, they brought him to the place. Israel was saying, you're going to start here. You're going to start at Hebron because this is what matters. This is who we are. This identifies us. And from this day on, we'll go forth. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt? You remember they sent spies into the land? They sent them to Hebron. And when they came back from Hebron, two men were carrying an enormous amount of grapes to show God's blessing at Hebron. Where they came was Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea means holy Barnea. It is the place set aside, set apart for God to do something so they could enter into the land. The Lord was ready to open the door to let them come in to the blessings and the joy and the power of God. It was all there for them. All they had to do was to believe God and they could walk into that land. But 10 of them came back with an evil report of what God had in store for them. But thank God for Joshua and Caleb Amen. because Joshua and Caleb said, so we can take the land. God's with us. God told us it's ours. We can do it. Even though it's a formidable foe, even though it looks like there's no way in the, in, the, in the world we could ever do it. Let me tell you something, folks. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. We don't fight with clubs. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't need knives and guns. So what do you do? You go against your enemy. You put on the sword. You take the shield. You put the helmet on. You put on the shoes. And then you take the word of God. And you know what you have in your hands? So Hebron would have been the place that he brought them together. When I went to Hebron, I was, I was, I was amazed at what I saw. It's a hilly place. The hills just roll like this. It's built of some kind of thing. Rolling hills. And all over those hills, grapes. Everywhere you looked. Grape, full of grapes. You know, the wine, the grape. It's all over the place. And then the road that leads you there, on one side of the road, you have the potters. I've never seen as many potters in my life. One potter after another. We stopped and went into the potter's house and we watched his wheel turn, his hands on that. Oh, he'd done it so many times before. As he's put his hands upon you so many times before. Oh, God, why do you keep fighting him? Why don't you let him put his hands on you today? Let him make you what he wants to make out of you. What a beautiful thing it is to see a pile of mud turn into a, something that is useful and beautiful. And many of those pieces of pottery are thousands of years old still around. That means what God does, he does it well, doesn't he? So we viewed the potter's house as we went into Hebron. On one side is the joy. On the other side is the creation and the maker. What a place. And God said, this is all yours. All you have to do is just come in and take it, and I'll give it to you. Nothing is free. Nothing is easy. When it's easy, you don't appreciate it. And you, don't, you, don't under, you, 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 under, you have to understand that we wrestle. We war a warfare. This, our enemy, the devil, as a, as a roaring lion, walks Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Have you ever heard a lion roar? Let me tell you what you do. You don't hear a lion roar. You feel a lion roar. <laughs> yes, you do. So Abraham and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried there. I was privileged. I knew I was privileged when I went in there. I knew it. When I went to the top of Moriah and I went down inside the Dome of the Rock, been a one time, only one, but I went in there, I knew I was privileged because there's a huge rock there, the top of Moriah. I knew I was privileged. God's been good to me. He's let me go to places and see things that a lot of people don't. And I just want you to understand this morning, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the blessings that God has given me. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23 now in verse number 8. 2 Samuel chapter number 23 and verse number 8. Let's talk about David's mighty men. David's mighty men. Remember the charisma of David that he drew men into himself. 
Well, on one hand, we mentioned the people that came to him because they were hungry. They were hurting. They were, they were, they were beaten down. They were bedraggled. This world had sucked the very life out of them. Yes. And they came to David. Why did they come to David? Because David cared for them. He would do something for them. And they knew it. You have a sense about that. Children have much greater sense than we do as adults. But they know if you care for them. A child knows if you love them. They have that sense about them. And you'll find out as you get older whether people care or not, you know, whether you get the plastic religious smile or you really have a hold of somebody who really loves you. And they're going to pray for you. But he had mighty men come. We're talking about warrior of warriors. Now we're talking about men like in the book of Judges who could sling a stone from a sling at a hair breadth. That's what it says. Well, he had them because it made reference back to Benjamin. He had men that would take hold of a sword and go into battle. Well, let me just read it. 1 Samuel 23, verse number 8. 2 Samuel 23, verse number 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Taklanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Ezhite. Look, watch this. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Now, I'm a Bible believer. Do you believe the Bible? You just read something right here that, oh, this is a bunch of hyperbole. This is just sad. No, 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 I believe the Bible. If he lifted up that sword and went against 800, he lifted it up and went against 800. Yes, sir. You either believe it or you don't. See, they put you into the test. Well, maybe a better translation. No, I'm not interested in better translations. No. What do you got in your hand? Now watch it further as we go down. Look at verse 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose. The men of Israel were gone away, gone away. he arose. His confederates were gone. They had left him. He was alone, and he arose. And he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. You never forget this. God's hand is always in what his people do. Amen. If Samson could take a jawbone of a donkey and kill thousands of Philistines with it, surely a man could raise a sword up. And what did he do? All of his men were gone. He was left alone. And he stood there and he fought the enemy. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Don't we have a a, a call from God to war, a good warfare? Have you laid your weapon down? Have you laid it aside? Have you laid it aside? Think about it for a moment. I was looking at a knife the other day, and I thought to myself, is that a violent knife or just a knife? You see the garbage you're being fed day in and day out? Gun violence. What do you mean gun violence? Like you got a violent gun? Is that what you're talking about? And this same crowd has their own bodyguards and their own enclosed walls and their own gates. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you've got guns, check to see if they're violent guns or not. You might have have to turn them in. Who knows? (laughs) Some of them just eat me alive, I'll tell you the truth. (laughs) Verse verse number 10. Uh, 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 2 Samuel 30, verse number 10. Now, look at this. And he arose and smote the Philistines till his hand was weary and his hand clave to the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. Now look at verse 11. After him was Shammah, the son of Aji, the Havarite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistine, but he stood in the midst of of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. These are men of courage. These are men of men. These are men. Uh, This is toxic masculinity. (laughs) Lord have mercy. (laughs) These are the kind of men that men follow. These are the kind of men that men respect. This is manhood, folks. These are the men that go to battle. 
and they went to battle, and they held the sword in their hand, and they fought to the death. Now, he's going to raise up another one here. And don't you look at this one here, 2 Samuel 23, verse number 20. Go on down to verse 20. We've got a quite a remarkable man now. Now, remember what I've just read to you, okay? <laughs> this is not the junior league we just read. Now, look at verse 20. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. Watch this. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the hand, the Egyptian's hand, and slew him with his own spear. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> Kids, let me tell you something. You've been watching these movies from Hollywood, okay? In these movies from Hollywood, you got these guys walk up and slap a monster in the face or act like they're so tough and act like they have, have this. They've got, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. That's acting. That's not the real world. When a man will go down into a pit with a lion and all he's got is a sword, that's courage. That's courage. I would say to you, young men, I was you one time, just like you. You're looking for a role model. You're looking for a man. You're looking for a man to help you with your manhood as you get older and as you grow and you develop. Well, then look at Benaiah. Look at him. The next time that Hollywood wants to tell you, he want to teach you, tell him, all right, let's dig a hole. <laughs> And you pick the lion. <laughs> yeah. And then you go down into it. Let's see how tough you are. Yeah. This is real world, folks. The real world. Now think of it. He loved David. Yeah. He was one of David's soldiers. Yeah, right. Honorable. Amen. Honorable. Took an Egyptian and took his sword away from him and smote him with his own sword. Amen. Seems to me like that sounds a lot like David. When he smote Goliath with a rock, took his own sword from him, cut his head off. That's what you got going on here. You got courage. You know something? I don't know of anything better for a young man and a young woman than to take the Bible and teach them from Scripture what womanhood and manhood and what life is really about. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people, all they get is God wants to bless you and he wants to make you rich and sow your seed and this and that bunch of garbage and they never touch the Bible. But I'm preaching the Bible to you this morning. This is a marvelous book. And I'm just scratching around a little bit here with just a little bit of it. This is a remarkable book. You just read what a man is all about. But there's something about him. It was quite a thing. Look over here in 1 Kings chapter number 4. And verse number four, when Absalom was born, he became a traitor to his father, didn't he? Abba Shalom, father of peace. When Eli, his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, lay at the tabernacle of God with women, would not receive the offerings as it came. Godless and vile, sons of Belial. Yeah. We take people like that all through the scripture. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, it doesn't sugarcoat it. That's why I believe it. The heroes of the Bible are real people living in a real world, breathing the same air you breathe, hurt like you hurt, hunger like you hunger. But it shows you the hand of God in their life. Now look at this man, Benaiah. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 4. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host, and Zadok and Abiathar with the priest. Under who? Solomon. You see, Solomon had become the king, and he knew courage when he saw it. He knew greatness when he saw it. And he knew Benaiah was a great man. So what did he do with it? He made him the commander of every bit of force that Israel had. That's what he did. He was an Eisenhower in World War II, the five-star general that was commander of the Allied troops. That's who he was. He gave him the authority. He, none were higher but the king. Solomon. 
So why did he do it? Because of his character. Because he knew that he wouldn't turn on him. He knew he wouldn't try to tear him down from the throne. He knew there wouldn't be a coup. He'd have, here he is, commander of all the forces of Israel, thousands and thousands. I mean, he could have had a palace coup and gotten rid of Solomon, but he didn't do it. You know why he didn't do it? Because of his character, that's why. You can rise to the top with charisma. You can rise to the top with talent. But it takes character to stay there. If your life has been a life of ease and everything's come easily and you've never really suffered, you've never hurt, you've never, never sacrificed, and you've never had them turn on you like the wolves and the dogs will turn on you. You don't know much about yourself yet. God's a good God. So what do you mean by that? He's a good God because he lets you, he lets you find out about yourself. And then when you begin to find out about yourself, then he'll show you who he is. Let me tell you something. I believe this now. I believe that Satan's greatest weapon is to hide the true character of God from your life. He's a good God. Some of you wouldn't be here this morning if he wasn't long-suffering. He's gracious. I don't care what you brought in here today. You may be stinking to high heaven, but if you'll come down here in this altar and get on your knees, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse your sins away. That's grace. That's our God. Takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Would have all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Christ tasted blood for, tasted death for every man. You mean to tell me, preacher, that I really don't have, I'm going to tell you, here's what I believe. I believe churches have an agenda. I do. Even the Baptist, they have an agenda. So what do you mean? By, well, they preach their platform. You know, the Democrats have their platform. The Republicans got their platform. So therefore, they are limited. They are limited to, to how they project themselves to the people. Okay? And so the people finally, after year and year and year and year, think that's it. That's what the Bible's about. It's all about this. This is what we believe. Here's my list right here. I believe all of this. I believe in virgin birth, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. I believe in hell. I believe this. I believe that. I believe this. As if to think you believe anything. It's not about believing all that stuff. It's about believing in the one who wrote the book. Yeah. Amen. You'll never have fellowship with God believing a bunch of stuff. The only way you'll ever have fellowship with him is to walk with him and to know him and to hunger for him. And that's what I call on you to do today is do that. I'll meet Benaiah one of these days. I may ask him, say, how do you feel when you got down there and heard that lion roar? You're down in a pit and there's not a soul to help you, boy. It's just you and the lion. Of course, we know our adversaries are roaring lion, walking about seeking who, may be devi- who he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We know that. We know that. His, we, know, we understand the wiles of the devil. But some of you are stuck. You're in a rut. Yeah. You're, you, you always go back to what I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe. What about who you know? Yeah. Do you know him? You understand that long suffering? For 27 years, he put up with me. Now, I know I'm fairly young for a lot of people. Some got saved in the 60s and 70s and so forth. Thank God I was 27. But he put up with a lot from me, but in 27 years, believe me, long suffering. Then when he called me and I came to him, got on my face and prayed to him, grace covered me. Yeah. All over me. Grace. Grace, grace, yeah. marvelous yeah. grace, God's grace, yeah. grace, 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 yeah. grace that can take away every sin. Yeah. Oh, grace covered me, and boy, did I ever know it when I got up. Yeah. Oh, I wish, I didn't, listen, if you've had it happen, I don't have to tell you, but if you've never had it happen, you're, you're not too sure of what's going on with me. You may be confused with it. I beg you, 
In the name of Jesus, come to the one who loves you more than anybody loves you, who died for you, who shed his precious blood for you, who will forgive you of your sins. He'll wash your sins away and he'll give you a new life. He'll, he'll give you a home in heaven and he'll put joy in your soul. Is all that for me? Preach absolutely for you. Kill you are. Making a difference. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for Boniah, Lord. Any man, any man can look to that man and respect him and say to himself, that's a man. <laughs> that's what manhood's about. That's a man. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, the people in this house, get some help. Lord, you know me. I'm just a preacher. Good night. Just the minister. I'm just, I'm just the one that gives the message out. You're the one that can change lives. And I pray you do that in Jesus' name. Anybody looking this morning? Why don't you keep your heads bowed for a minute? I want you to pray for Dwight Moreland. Pray for Dwight Moreland. He's an AFib and his heart's out of rhythm. His blood pressure's shooting up and down. He's got all kinds of problems going on right now, and he can't get an he can't get a a, 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 a what do you call cardiologist. He's having trouble getting a cardiologist right now. Would you pray for him? Would you pray for him? Dwight Moreland. We've got Betty Durr, broke hip. Three weeks she went and limped around with a broken hip, hurting, 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 hurting. She's doing better. She's doing better. Play for, would you pray for Gloria Howe? Sick as a dog. Having a hard time breathing. Says to me, preacher, if I'm not going to get any better, I'd just soon God come get me and take me home. And I don't doubt my mind for a minute that she's ready. She knows where she's going. She loves the Lord. That's just three, folks. That's just three. But the reason I picked those three because they're, they're, they're hurting. They're hurting. Now, some of you in this house today, it's not so much physical that you hurt. It's spiritual that you hurt. You hurt spiritually, and you know you do. You suffer. You can't, you, you, some of you got to the point you can't even live with yourself. You're miserable. Well, you don't have to be miserable. If you'll come to him this morning, just get on your knees and say, Lord God, I don't know anything. I don't need to know anything, but I know this. I know you love me, and I know you can forgive me, and I know you can cleanse me. Would you do that for me, Lord? Would you cleanse me? Would you wash my sins away? Anybody raise your hands and say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me because that's what I want to do. Anybody? Pray for me. God bless you there. God bless you here. Anybody else? Hands going up. Anybody? Yes, sure. God bless you back there. God bless you here. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you here. God bless you. This is what I do. I'm a minister. God's called me to do this. I'm not God, and I cannot take the place of God, but I can sure pray for you. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Father, in Jesus' name, we bring these souls before thee. Heavenly Father, I know this is sacred ground. I know it is. And Lord, I do what you've called me to do, and I pray for them. And Father, I pray that you move in their hearts, and whatever it takes to move them, that they'd move, that they'd come, they'd do something today, that they'd make peace with God and walk out of this house in joy and power and love and have a new life. In thy name I pray, amen. All right, brother, what do we got? 401, the All-American Church hymn, they only trust him. Trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. When you trust God, you're trusting his character, folks. And his character is unassailable. His character. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Only trust him. Go ahead, brother. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to be stored. Now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him. 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 Only
trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. One day in the midst of his brethren, he'll be anointed. He was anointed here by the Holy Spirit when he was baptized in the Jordan. And one day in the midst of his brethren, when all of Israel is gathered together, they'll see their Messiah. They'll know their king. They'll know they've rejected him. And they'll mourn for him as one that mourned for his only son. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. As the first David was the only one that could ever pull Israel together. The only one. Jesus Christ, son of David, Matthew chapter 1 will pull them together again. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll pray. And, uh, you know, you're not saved or get right with God because somebody took hold of you and forced you into anything. But I know his word. We got good seed. Amen. Amen. Brother Lawson, Let's have uh, prayer. Yes, sir. I'd like to meet with all the instrumentalists, the, the violin players, the guitar, mandolin, and all for just a few minutes in the back, all the hand, handheld instruments, and just just for a, a few minutes. And also, uh, someone turned in a set of keys that they found in the ladies' restroom. So somebody's lost a set somebody's of keys. Somebody's going to be missing them. That's for we'll, certain. We'll put them on the <laughs> we'll put them on the pulpit. And uh, do what? You can go out and start your car and don't have your keys right there. Watch your talk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember, Chris. Yeah. Chris Hubbs grew up here. He's, he's got prostate cancer. God can heal him. Chris, a good man. Yes. Yeah. Still hurting. Remember little Harley, she's still waiting for a donor. They're waiting for a, a blood, a bone a marrow donor for her. And uh, please remember her in prayer. There's always somebody who needs praying, don't they? Always somebody who needs prayer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will. We'll be glad to. Amen. We will pray for her. Folks, take note of what's being said here this morning, quest being given. And when you pray, you may not have you may not know all the names, but just think about the one you're talking about. Somebody back here, yes, sir. <coughs> oh, let's pray for this lady's friend. I think that's what you said. And uh, <clears throat> she went into detail about some of the need. All right. Okay. Let's have prayer and we'll let you go. And uh, young man over here spoke to our kids the other day, Preston McNeese. You know his dad, Dean McNeese. And he's going to school out here at Crown College, studying for the ministry. And uh, pray for him. I'd like for him to dismiss us this morning. Would you do that, Preston?